I'm reading from Luke chapter 18, beginning with verse 35. As Jesus was approaching Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the road begging. Now hearing a crowd going by, he began to inquire what this was. They told him that Jesus of Nazareth was passing by. And he called out saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Those who led the way were sternly telling him to be quiet. But he kept crying out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and commanded that he be brought to him. And when he came near, he questioned him, What do you want me to do for you? And he said, Lord, I want to regain my sight. And Jesus said to him, Receive your sight, your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and began following him, glorifying God, and when all the people saw it, they gave praise to God. When he entered Jericho and was passing through, and there was a man called by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and he was rich. Zacchaeus was trying to see who Jesus was and, when, and was unable because of the crowd for he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree in order to see him, for he was to pass through that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for today I must stay at your house. And he hurried and came down and received him gladly. When they saw it, they all began to grumble, saying, he is gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. Zacchaeus stopped and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, half of my possessions I will give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will give back four times as much. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Our common theme in the readings of this morning from Joshua chapter 2 and Joshua chapter 6 and now Luke chapter 18 and 19 is the city of Jericho, the great ancient city of Jericho. And I am intrigued with the comparison or rather the contrast which Luke makes here between a man who was at the very bottom of the socioeconomic ladder and one who was likely about as high as you could go. He is described here as being very rich. This comparison reminds me of another that Luke makes in Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16, Paul and his evangelistic party have come to the great colony, Roman colony city of Philippi, and they are preaching the gospel. We suspect that it just might be that Luke was originally from Philippi and that he takes particular interest in these three, which he outlines for us, beyond that of pretty much anyone else in the book of Acts, he tells us the account of the woman, the businesswoman, seller of purple cloth named Lydia, and a slave girl, demon-possessed, and bringing her masters much profit by her soothsaying, by her divination, and also a Roman jailer. Each of them are mightily impacted by the gospel being preached in that city. But Lydia, she would have been a woman of considerable wealth, dealing in that very valuable fabric called purple. The Roman jailer, he was in a form of retirement. Having actually survived as a Roman trooper, he was posted to that colony as his pension or as his retirement, and given the job, uh, the job of jailer of the city. 
And the slave girl, she had nothing. Nothing whatsoever. So, economically, they were divided. In gender, there were two women and one man. In their religion, surely, we see that Lydia, she was a God-fearer. She honored the Old Testament and met with those who were meeting for prayer down by the river, as Jews were, would do when they didn't have enough men in order to build a synagogue in a particular place. The Roman, he would have followed after his Roman gods, and the slave girl, she would have fallen in the world of the occult. So very different. But yet the power of God comes, and it impacts their lives, and their lives are truly transformed. Here also in Jericho, we have an indication through the pen of Luke, the beloved physician, how that lives have been changed by the power of God. Interesting that the, of the three people we know about through the centuries of Jericho, Rahab, Bartimaeus, and Zacchaeus, all of them, we know their names. That certainly isn't true for everyone who Jesus ministered to. But here, as we come and as we consider Jericho, we have Rahab, the innkeeper, who was a woman of ill repute, a harlot, but through her kindness to the spies, she is enveloped and she comes into the community, into the covenant of the Jews. And let me also say that she comes not only into that, but she comes into the family tree of Jesus himself. We fast forward now and we come 14 centuries along the timeline and we come to Jesus as He is entering into Jericho. He is on His last lap. Last lap. After this, He starts on up to Jerusalem. And though He would come out of Jerusalem once or twice, in order to enjoy the hospitality at the home of his friends Mary, Martha, and Lazarus in Bethany, Jesus would, in his physical human body, this would be his last visit to Jericho, he had bid farewell to the Sea of Galilee and the sailings which he had made with his disciples. No longer would he see Capernaum or Bethsaida or Nazareth, or any other place, Jesus was on his last lap. I think the reason why Luke, under the Holy Ghost, gives to us both Acts chapter 16 and also what we read here in the account of Jericho is that he is answering this vital question, who is of interest to the Lord? Who does he extend his hand to? Consider with me a few different passages of scriptures. There were self-appointed gatekeepers in the first century world and in the life of Jesus and who were there to see his ministry. I think of Luke chapter 7 and verses 4 and 5. Jesus was in, his, in Capernaum, which had become his hometown after Nazareth. And there was a centurion slave who was about to die. And it isn't the centurion who comes to Jesus. It is Jewish elders. This is fascinating because typically these men would have nothing to do with a Roman overlord, which is what a centurion was a part of. A ruler or, or a, a one who watched over a hundred Roman troopers. And these elders, they come to Jesus asking him to save the life of this man's slave. Verse 4 says, When they came to Jesus, they earnestly implored him, saying, He is worthy for you to grant this to him, for he loves our nation, and it was he who built us our synagogue. Now, when you hear from someone, he is worthy. You also understand in that, well, you know, there are some who aren't worthy, most certainly not. But Jesus, your power, 
Uh, not all of us are perfectly sure where it comes from, but it seems to be doing some pretty good stuff around here. We want you to do a kindness to this man who has done a kindness to us. He has been very philanthropic. He has been generous with his cash. And he has built us our synagogue. We think that you should do something for him. And so really, these they were giving their approval. They were giving their blessing. They were saying, it's okay in our minds for you to do something for this fellow. We come fast-forwarding Luke chapter 18, and it's the episode of a rich young ruler coming to Jesus to ask him, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? The outcome of this dialogue that they have is that the young man goes away very sad because he was extremely rich. Jesus says to his disciples as this fellow is going on his way, how hard it is for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples, their world is blown apart by this. They thought, well, surely it's the rich who are getting in. Obviously, God is blessing them and God is helping them. And The disciples, when they heard this, they said, then who can be saved? If the rich aren't getting in, if it's with that much difficulty, obviously, you know, they, they tithe more, they give more, they do more, uh, then who, who of us stands any hope? Once again, in the minds of the disciples, there were certain things that were very much askew. In Mark chapter 1, verse 37, Jesus is at the outset of his ministry and he's done some miracles and that has very quickly gathered people. Crowds have pressed in upon Jesus. Early one morning, like I mean very early one morning, Jesus gets up and he goes to a secluded place to pray. Simon, that's Peter, comes with his companions. They're not called disciples at that point, but Simon and his companions come and they find Jesus and they say to him, everyone is looking for you. And Jesus says to them, oh, we've got to go. We, we're not going to deal with these people any longer. We have other places where we have to go. So at first, the disciples say, this is great. Crowds of people are looking for you and they want to hear you. And Jesus says, we have to go. You go forward to Mark chapter 6 and verses 35 and 36. It's the account of the feeding of the 5,000. Jesus has been ministering to the people and it comes late in the day. And the disciples say, you know, Jesus, we have to get rid of these people. Interesting that before it was, hey, we've got to keep these people. Now they're saying, we've got to get rid of these people. Send them away. Let them go into the surrounding villages and find something to eat. We want them off of our hands. Jesus says, they stay. You take care of them. Fascinating. The disciples, first of all, wanted the, the crowds. And Jesus says, no, we have to go. Then when the crowds were there and the disciples are saying, let's get rid of them. Jesus says, they stay and we're going to take care of them. We're going to meet the need that is so evident. I also think of Matthew chapter 15 in this whole business of the gatekeepers of who gets near to Jesus and who receives of his blessing, who is able to tap into the power of God. Matthew chapter 15, the disciples were taken by Jesus to the very far north. Syrophoenicia, it was called. And there, a widow woman with a demon-possessed little girl is crying after Jesus. And once again, we have this picture of the disciples saying, send her away. She's just such a nuisance. She's yelling at us. She's making such a fuss. Uh, my ears hurt. Get rid of her. 
But Jesus reaches out to her just as he reached out to those people who were hungry, those 5,000 plus. And of course, there is in Luke chapter 18, the account of the mothers with their children. And the disciples, they said, whoa, hold on there. That's far enough. Those runny noses, they're not coming anywhere near Jesus. And the disciples, they thought that they kept the appointment book of Jesus and also sort of the dignity book. It wasn't just a time matter and it just wasn't a power matter. It was a dignity matter. And they said, no, you're not getting near to Jesus. That's far enough. And Jesus rebukes them and he says, let the children come and he blesses them. Jesus is coming on this last lap into Jericho. And there was a blind man, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, sitting by the road as he had undoubtedly done for days, weeks, months, and years. When one sense is taken away, others kick in sort of in turbo. They go on steroids. Bartimaeus had been in the habit of picking up tension in a voice, tension in a crowd, uncertainty or joy or a secret that might be just about to burst out. The person could hardly hold it. He could detect various things round about him. But here was something that was different. A crowd was coming by and he began to inquire of whoever was round about him. We don't know who it was, other beggars or, or merchants, who, who it was that was coming by. And they told him that Jesus of Nazareth was passing by. Jesus of Nazareth. And that absolutely grabbed his attention. He was not concerned about his cup or about his begging for his next bit of bread. He calls out saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. You remember that when Jesus would make his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, that the crowds would yell, Hosanna to the son of David. Bartimaeus had the jump on them by at least several days, a week or more. He cries out, Royalty! King, have mercy on me, Jesus, salvation. Those who led the way were sternly telling him to be quiet. They did not want their city to be remembered because, by, by way of Bartimaeus and this grubby beggar sitting by the road, yelling and making a clamor. They didn't want Jesus to associate, oh yeah, Jericho, we walked in there and there was this scruffy looking guy yelling and making a fuss. He said, will you please clam up and be quiet? But he kept on all the more. Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stops the whole procession and commanded that he be brought to him. And when he comes near, Jesus asks him, what does mercy look like in your mind? You have asked me for mercy. What do you want me to do for you? What is it that mercy, how do you equate that? How does it get put together in your head and heart? And Bartimaeus immediately said, Lord, I want to regain my sight. You see, Bartimaeus he saw what all the rest didn't see. I suspect that many people there, they saw a miracle, working, a miracle worker coming or a great teacher, someone who had a certain notoriety around the countryside. Bartimaeus, he saw, though blind, he had spiritual perception to see that this was not simply 
a dignitary who was coming, a person of some note, a person who could easily draw a crowd, here was power to make a difference in his life. Lord, I want to regain my sight. And Jesus said to him, regain or receive your sight. Your faith, you have perceived, you have hit the center of the mark. Your faith, your perception has made you well. And immediately he regained his sight and began following him. What a horrible thing it would have been if Bartimaeus had said, oh, thank you very much. This is most kind of you. I do appreciate it most sincerely. I will contribute regularly to your cause and always speak well of you, but I'm going off on my way. He followed Jesus and he understood this was not of man. This was not some fancy bit of anything of man's doing. This was of God. He followed glorifying God, and when the people saw it, they also did the right thing and gave praise to God. So, we have the low of the low. We've got Bartimaeus on the very bottom of the echelon. Now we shoot to the very uppermost reach of what Jericho had to offer. Jesus enters Jericho and was passing through, and oh no, there was a man by the name of Zacchaeus. He was the chairman of the board of the Jericho Revenue Agency, and he was rich. Those who would read this account in the first century, they would have known instantly that there was a dark cloud which now formed that at the name of a tax collector and especially one who is over other tax collectors that he had his money or he had his fingers deep in the pot. Zacchaeus he was trying to see who Jesus was but it was like people had locked arm to arm, and they had become a wall. And because Zacchaeus, he had this, this uh, elevation problem, he had this height challenge, he has to go to a sycamore tree a little bit farther on down the road because he anticipated that Jesus and his company would pass that way. Zacchaeus is set. He has a hunger in his heart that all of that wealth could not deal with. He desperately wants to see Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus comes to the very place where Zacchaeus is, and again, everything stops. Zacchaeus, Jesus says, and I suspect that there is in the crowd that day an instant wonder, is Jesus going to do the right thing? Is he going to call down lightning on this man's head for all of the meanness, for all of the corruption that has passed through his hands? Maybe some thought, oh no, Jesus, you don't want to have anything to do with that man. But Jesus says, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for today I must stay at your house. He was going to receive the hospitality of a man such as Zacchaeus. Well, Zacchaeus was elated. He comes down as fast as he can, and he receives Jesus gladly. But see the response of the crowd. These ones who had, gave, had given praise to God at the healing of Bartimaeus, all of a sudden, he's gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. I tell you, this man is bad to the bone. But Zacchaeus, as they're going along their way, he says to Jesus, Lord, you see there's been a change of heart in this man. 
Lord, half of my possessions I will give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will give back four times as much. And Jesus, he talks about Zacchaeus being a son of Abraham. He says, today salvation has come to this house because he too is a son of Abraham. What is it to be a son of Abraham? The Apostle Paul in Romans, he talks about not all who are physically descended from Abraham are the children of Abraham, but those who are of the faith of Abraham. Here we have Jesus who understood this better than even the Apostle Paul. He names Zacchaeus as a son of Abraham and he declares salvation. There has been a transformation. There has been something at work in this heart and in this life. And Jesus says, for this is exactly why I have come. The Son of Man has come to seek. He went seeking in Syrophoenicia, and he went seeking in Capernaum, and he went seeking in Nazareth, and he went seeking all through the villages and in Samaria. He went seeking, and he went saving that which was lost. The disciples and others, the crowds, those Jewish elders, how far off the mark they were as to who, who gets in to God's graces. Who gets in on all the goodies? Who gets in on the kindness of God? I suspect many people would have written Bartimaeus out, but he got in. I suspect that at least as many would have written Zacchaeus out, but he was in. And the mercy of God reaches to us as well. In Acts chapter 10, verses 34 and 35, Peter, he has been through two visions directed to the house of the centurion Cornelius in Caesarea. And one of the first things that Peter says is, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality, but in every nation, the man, doesn't matter what, what that man has in his pocket, whether he's rich or poor, what the color of his skin, or any of those other things that we think divides people, in every nation, the man who fears him and does what is right is welcome to him. Lord, we give you thanks for grace that we receive of your hand. We rejoice in you. May it be that we have your understanding of what you desire to accomplish in this world. And so may we live and serve and extend the opportunity to others for you to work in their lives also, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.